Smith has always liked impromptu speaking, in part because he requires no advanced preparation. <laughs> he did at least yeah. 250 <laughs> impromptu speeches in competition when he was a college debater. More recently, he did all 10 speeches for his fifth comp com competent communicator award in 2015 impromptu, just to see if he, it could be done. Yes, it can. In Project 1, Impromptu Speaking from the Advanced Communication Series Manual, spe Specialty Speeches, Lloyd will do an impromptu speech. His topic will be drawn at random by his evaluator from a group of five topics he provided. Lloyd Smith and Impromptu Speaking. Alternative facts. That's a term that none of us had ever heard before a few months ago when alternative facts began to spring up all over the place. It's an interesting thing. What is a fact and what is not? That's something we rarely think about. We just tend to think that facts are just the things that really are. But in a uh, philosophical sense or not, the branch of philosophy that deals with knowledge is called epistemology. And epistemological theory says that something is true, that is, it's factual, if it satisfies a, a, an algorithm called the tripartite account. In other words, in order to be true, something has to actually be verifiably true. You have to believe it, and you have to have some reason for believing it. If all of those, all three of those things are true, then it's knowledge as far as you're concerned. Now, that raises some interesting issues. For example, most of us in here have probably heard people say, I know God exists. In reality, no, nobody knows God exists because there's no way to verify it empirically. In other words, there's no place, nothing you can look at or measure or touch or whatnot. What actually is going on is that you believe God exists. Now that's good enough. That's all you need in order to have faith. Faith is proof without the, or is um, acceptance without the need for proof. And that's plenty when you're talking about God. But you can't say that you know God exists because he may or may not, it's in terms of the philosophical nature of knowledge. Now, when you take an, a recent example, like a, the one that pops into my mind right now, is President Trump's assertion that he had the largest crowd at his inauguration of any president. Now that seemed to run counter to the truth, the verifiable truth. Uh, they had pictures of several previous inaugurations that the crowd gathers in the mall. If you've ever been in Washington, D.C., you know what I'm talking about. It's this huge, huge grassy area that runs from the Capitol building all the way to the Washington Monument. And then it spills over into some of the side streets, too. Uh, I've never been to a presidential inauguration, but I'm told that it's spectacular when you're in a crowd that large. And it appeared that the pictures of previous inaugurations contained more people than the picture of Trump's inauguration. Now, first of all, does that matter? Well, no. I mean, who cares how many people actually showed up to watch the inauguration? You can watch it on TV. And it was, the weather was not very good that day in any event. And I suspect a lot of people decided not to stand out in the cold for hours and hours and watch it in person when they could get a far better view on TV. But the question is, is it true that there were more people at his inauguration? Now, uh, did he believe it? Probably. He looked like he believed it, believed it when he said it on TV. Was his belief justifiable? In other words, did he have a reason to believe it? Now, according to him, he did. Uh, the National Park Service controls them all, and they, about 10 years ago, they quit reporting the size of crowds. And the reason is they got sued every time they uh, estimated a crowd by somebody who wanted a bigger crowd to be there. And so they just said, no more. We're not going to do it anymore. But it's still possible to estimate the crowds based on the area. They can take like a block, they, not the Park Service, but somebody else can, can like basically take a block and roughly count how many people are in it. They, they can have high angle photographs and then multiply that by the number of blocks. And several different organizations reported to President Trump that he did have a large crowd, at least in certain areas. So was he justified in believing? Possibly so. 
have to give him the benefit of the doubt. But was it verifiably true? And almost certainly not. You could look at the pictures and see it. Now, it raises a question about alternative facts and several other things to do, too. Why would anyone bother? I mean, you know, if I were the president and somebody said, well, you didn't have a big crowd at your inauguration, I'd say, tough luck, I'm still the president. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that doesn't bother me. You know, who cares if one person showed up as long as he was the guy holding the book and giving the oath, you're okay. <laughs> but, you know, it, it does make you wonder. Apparently, it's a, a desire not to lose is what it amounts to, to lose faith. Uh, a better illustration of this alternative fact thing, though, was when uh, one of the president's advisors, Kellyanne Conway, was a really important advisor in his campaign, and then is now an important White House advisor, managed to apparently create a terrorist attack, the Bowling Green Massacre. You may not have heard of the Bowling Green Massacre, and that's because it didn't happen in the real world. But rather than just say, I screwed up, which she could have later, there, there was a terrorist a guy arrested for terrorist threats who lived in Bowling Green. He was apparently going to attack some military recruiting places and either didn't do it or couldn't do it or whatever. But anyway, that's probably what she was thinking about. But rather than saying, oh, I said it wrong, you know, apologizing and moving on, she tried to bowl it forward for several days. And that's really the puzzling thing about this whole alternative fact thing, is if, if you say something wrong, why not just admit it? You know, everybody would just say, oh yeah, I've done that too, and then you move on. But the more you try to sell it, if it's wrong, the more people push back, and the more likely you are to look like a total horse's patootie. <laughs> and that's exactly what has happened to some of these people. I think what it boils down to, not just the president and his people, everybody, including all of us in this room, we don't like to look bad. And when we say something and somebody stuffs it back in our face, we don't like that. I mean, that's not a happy feeling. And so the idea is to defend yourself. It's probably better just to admit a mistake and move on. Usually the attempt to mitigate it somehow, make it look better, make it look like somebody else's fault, makes you look worse and worse and worse. You know, what it boils down to is if you're in a hole, stop shoveling. And that's what some of these people don't get. Mr. <laughs>